Hey folks, Todd Colburn here with your Aerospace Structure Series. This is the first of the video lectures for our Composites class. You'll notice I posted a number of book reviews for my book and other useful books you may want, and there will be links to help connect you with that material if you choose to uh, get one of those for your library. There's also a MATLAB video that those of you who want to learn to program MATLAB as we go to do our composites work can start with those in the MATLAB playlist. And now we're going to start looking at the basics, kind of an overview of composites. Let's take a look. So a composite material is, uh, so actually we need to differentiate Brun uses, his text uses the idea, that word composite, to represent multi-flanged members like I-beams and J-sections. That is one term for composite, but when I'm using composite in this course, what we're talking about is a composite of multiple materials. These have been around since the beginning of time, since the beginning of mankind on this earth. Plywood, which is common today, was used by the ancient Egyptians, as was uh, making bricks where they would put straw in bricks for additional strength, as we see recorded in the book of Exodus. Swords have been starting off with probably a single material like a copper, but we see from the earliest pages of Genesis that mankind was making iron as well from the beginning. And over time, mankind learned to use different materials or different alloys or put different levels of copper, uh, of carbon into their sword, making different materials, different uh, hardnesses within the material to get a better result. Bows have been, uh, you know, the simplest bow is just cut from a piece of wood. But from the beginning of time also, mankind has been making bows that have sinew and uh, woods and uh, other leathers and other materials to get the right properties. The ancient Assy Ass uh, Syrians used wood, horn, sinew, and there are ancient records of some amazing shots that haven't even been duplicated today by some of the technology that some of our forefathers developed. Golf clubs. It's real trendy now to get a composite golf club. I'm not sure that really helps your game, but it looks flashy. And there are many times composites, while they offer increased strength, stiffness, or engineered strength and stiffness, which means you can get the precise values you need. For a lot of materials, vehicles, and other things, it's kind of just bragging rights to show that we're cutting edge. And while a composite does offer a lighter weight and potentially stronger material, it also introduces complications and cost. And sometimes that change is more just to show that we're at the cutting edge than it is to actually get a better product. Although it is possible to get a better product with appropriate detailed engineering. So we can see some modern examples would be golf clubs, guns, windmills, boat holes, car bodies, rockets, you name it. Things are being made from combinations of materials. This is a little slide I pulled off the internet that shows uh, composite use on a 787. Um, composites have been growing over the course of my career in use as they have improved in uh, characterizing the, the um, capabilities and as experience has been gained in their use. Um, this is the A380 and this is some of the parts on an A380 aircraft that are allegedly composite. Here's some little figures of composite use on other aircraft are very common in interior structures. Um, while uh, they're actually, so just because folks are using composites doesn't mean it's the best use of material for a particular application. You need to carefully figure out for your application, is a composite giving a specific benefit? And is it worth the extra cost and the extra uh, engineering to make sure there's not a failure mode that you've missed. The more materials that are involved and the more complicated the combination 
while that increases the ability to specifically engineer your product, it also increases the risk significantly of a dramatic and unexpected failure from some behavior that you haven't seen before because you've combined composites in a way, combined materials in a way that maybe uh, there's not common experience for and knowledge posted. So you need to be careful. Here's some composite use on rockets. Here's the Delta IV, which I worked on the inception of that before it went off to the ULA and the uh, Atlas IV and some other stuff. If we take a quick look at composite, we see here on the upper right, we see a fabric. This fabric is ready to be used, but it's not uh, ready to be used in its current state. This is just fabric, which is going to give uh, orthotropic kind of property. You're going to get properties in the two directions, but it's going to be really uh, ridiculously unable to carry load in shear. And it's basically, and it's not going to be able to take any compression. This needs to be embedded in a matrix material. It needs to be impregnated with a resin of some kind or some kind of matrix material to make it act like a stiff, strong member that will carry other loads besides just tension, membrane tension loads. Um, but this is a common form that we will start with as we're creating our product. Um, you see over here, upper left, this is a typical laminated product. We can see. Um, materials. It looks like the outer two materials. It looks like it's a solid material, but that's probably a matrix like a resin. A lot of times what they'll do is they'll pour resin to a uniform thickness on a sheet and they will sandwich it on one side or both sides of a fabric and press those together. You can see the little rods. Those look like little fibers there. And in the middle, it may be a core material or it may be another layer of material. Over on the lower uh, two a piece in the lower left, we see a sandwich. We're going to learn about that later as well, where we have an upper and lower face sheet. The lower left NASA picture looks like we've got aluminum face sheets and aluminized honeycomb in between. And the, the uh, little figure just above that shows a little cutaway of the face sheets. You can see the structure of the honeycomb. We'll look at all that kind of stuff later. And then lower right, you see various manufactured composites. We see it um, uh, looks like laminated multi-layers of composite, different types and textures of composites. These are the kind of things we're going to be using. Now, if we take a look at usage, this is from Ramadan's notes, I believe, uh, back that uh, when I took his class some time ago. This is a little figure that shows the progression of years in different aircraft that came up with more and more composite, this shows percentage. And you'll notice that even at the top here, it's only like 15%. So this only goes out to what, just past 1995. And now we're here at 2023. Composites has grown significantly. As we saw before, the Dreamliner, the 787 Dreamliners, allegedly something like 15, 50% uh, composite in the A380. Um, uh, in 2005 was 25% composite and by 2014 also 53% composite. So um, composite use is growing so you taking the time to learn the techniques that we're going to cover in this class can pay dividends into your career in the future. The focus for our class, if we just take a look at this little uh, figure from our text the figure A is just a solid material, solid isotropic. If we have only solid isotropic materials, we don't need this class composites. We can deal with that with the methods that we learned in mechanics and materials classes. Our Aero 3261, Aero 3271 all deal with these kind of materials and other undergraduate mechanics and materials classes. Now if we get a material that has particles, now that's actually a composite, right? There's particles within some kind of matrix. However, if they're uniformly stirred and if we can measure those properties and they seem to be the same in all directions and it seems to be uniformly spread out the, the material, then we can actually treat that like an isotropic material as well. It just may have a little different failure properties and such. Same thing is true for short fibers. 
like figure C, if we chop up little short fibers. Now, when we do that, we got little short fibers, they're going to have typically better strength in the longitudinal direction. However, if they're uniformly spread and oriented, that can result in a product that acts kind of like an isotropic material. If it does, we can just test that to characterize this behavior and treat it like an isotropic material. We don't need this glass. However, it's possible that those short fibers, let's say they're laid out, let's say you take uh, spaghetti noodles and you lay them out lengthwise, you've got short values of them, but when you crop that your manufacturing process orients them all in roughly the same direction, that will end up with unidirectional properties and we now, the methods of isotropic methods that we've learned won't be sufficient, and some of the methods we're going to use here will cover that. Also, even more so for continuous fibers. Continuous fibers are extremely strong and stiff, or can be extremely strong and stiff in the longitudinal direction, like a string. However, a string has like zero shear strength and zero compression strength. If we lay them all longitudinal in the same direction, we still have something that's strong in tension, zero strength compression, zero strength shear. If we now embed it in a matrix that fills those fibers, that completely impregnates it so that each fiber is surrounded in a warm bed, like being underwater of this other material, and it cures into a single material, so these fibers stay oriented, that matrix material can cause those to work together such that you don't get the individual fiber failures uh, that, uh, or, or lack of stiffness that we had before. It makes them act together and it actually bonds them together so you can get a compressive strength that may be close or even better than the tension strength because of the matrix which can be a much uh, uh, quite a different material. So. Continuous fibers embedded in a matrix is a very, uh, a very capable product that offers a world of possibilities for engineering stronger, stiffer, lighter weight, and potentially cheaper products. Usually composites are going to be more expensive, but it is possible with proper processing to actually make a cheaper pro process product for some uh, applications. So continuous fibers embedded. Now this is very directional. That means we're going to have a different set of properties in the longitudinal direction. We call that the warp direction, the longitudinal direction of those fibers. Um, and also we're going to refer to that as the principal material one direction. The principal uh, a material has principal directions with an isotropic material. It's the same in all directions. But for a directional material, it's going to have directional properties and the principal material property we're going to call material property uh, the one direction and the, uh, then we're going to have a lateral which we sometimes loosely call transverse but usually we save the, the transverse word for true thickness through the short dimension and then a widthwise dimension now it's possible for these continuous fibers to have the same properties in both widthwise directions but it's also very common for it to have a different width-wise property from a transverse property. We'll be dealing with some of those concepts in the future, but understanding that now can help. So we have these fibers aligned, embedded in some kind of matrix. We're getting the benefit of their strength, not only for axial, but also for compression, not only for tension, but also compression, and also getting shear strength now, both in plane and transverse to the plane. Now we have an engineered product that's useful. We can actually increase that even now. This could, you can see this continuous fibers is shown in one direction. And yet we can also have a woven fabric. We'll be talking about that next class that provides properties in two orthogonal directions. And uh, that's also very common and offers a number of mm, improvements as well. Although with a slight loss of some properties and a gain of other properties. The next thing we can do to engineer this even more is to have a composite that's made of multiple layers. Now you can actually put comp uh, composites together in any kind of jumbled way you want, but the problem is each combination causes or 
introduces complexities that can be very challenging to deal with analytically and very hard to get repeatable behavior. Engineering is all about repeatable behavior. We can have a very weak product and use it well if we know precisely how it will behave in a number of environments and we carefully use it in a way that doesn't exceed its capability. However, having on the other hand, we can have a very strong product that commonly fails if it is so unpredictable that we can't accurately predict how it will respond to all loads it gets. So one way of making uh, introducing more advantages of different materials being added together, which we're calling composite, is to make a laminate product where we have layers of material. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to characterize the capability of each layer, the strength, stiffness, and other properties. Strength, stiffness, so we can focus on each layer and figure out its primary properties. Then we can put it together in other in a laminate and bond those together using a suitable bonding agent that makes them all act together. And now not only do we get the benefit of having the composite potential in each layer, we now have the benefit of having different layers with different properties. So typically like an I-beam where we want to get the area far away from the center of the beam, with this kind of thing we can get our stiffnesses really high away from the center and use weaker products toward the middle or pick up some of the other capability like the shear capability by using different orientations of materials. Now each of these layers can be any material. It's very common to use fiber reinforced composites for these layers. Honeycomb is also very common for a core-like material. We can also use solids and isotropic materials like aluminums or steels. We can use balsa woods. Any layer can be nearly anything as long as it is uh, predictable. And it's going to need to be roughly homogeneous, at least on a macroscopic scale, which means each layer is basically the same all over the place. And it's going to have, we're going to need to be able to characterize its directional properties, whether it's isotropic, single, same in all directions, or orthotropic has two perpendicular significant properties, or anisotropic, different in a bunch of directions, we're going to need to characterize that, and as long as we can characterize it accurately and repeatably, we can use that in the layers. The next thing we're going to need to be able to do is have a bonding agent that puts these together. With things like graphite epoxies, a lot of times the epoxy is sufficient when cured to bond the other layer. Same thing with fiberglass. A lot of times will just bond to itself when it's cured. But other materials, like uh, sandwich materials, will typically need some kind of bonding agent, like an FM300 or some other bond. FM300 is like a thin lay sheet of adhesive material that they will lay out on like a, a core material and then bond the phase sheet to it. While the phase sheet, the epoxy has some bonding capability. The problem is if you put it on like a honeycomb core or other kinds of cores, sometimes what will happen is the resin will be sucked away from the fiber, leaving a resin-starved fiber, which can cause your properties not to be what you think they're going to be, which is a problem. So, our focus, anything that is not high isotropic. If we have a uh, isotropic property, whether it's actually isotropic or whether it is behaves like an isotropic property, we can use our old methods, don't need this class. Anything that is directional, or layer driven, we can handle, we're going to need the methods of this class. And we're going to make a number of simplifications because it gets really complicated fast analytically. But we're going to make some gross simplifications. And while this will completely ne neglect some basic engineering principles, this will also allow us to uh, evaluate this. And it's been shown with testing that this is giving us sufficiently accurate results. That's what this class is all about. Whether you're following online as a student or an engineer, or whether you're taking my class and just using this to augment our in-class uh, lectures, that's what we're going to do. All right, so taking a little further look, we're going to actually pull this slide up next lecture as well. Here are some fibrous composites. So we here see here we have a one, two, three, four-layer composite 
we see these are fiber reinforced pro products. Now it looks like these fibers are like sitting out here in the middle of the resin with all this gap between them. Not so. This is just a graphic that uh, shows that we've got a fibrous product. In fact, these are going to be all mushed together and tight. And it's going to act like the resin is all completely in, in contact, or excuse me, the fibers are completely in contact with themselves. And that the resin is all over everything and in between the little strands of the fiber and between the fibers themselves. So this mnemonic doesn't do justice to that. But just imagine we've got this directional property. As we can see, the upper layer has, is probably going to have a strong longitudinal property and a lesser Widthwise and transverse direction. We'll see the next layer is looks like it's about 45 degrees, which is going to have strong property in that 45 degree angle. The next layer is going a 90, and so that's going to have strong properties in the in the widthwise direction. And then we got another 45. This is going to give us something that has its greatest stiffness. This is going to be uh, if you look at the hole and you embed it in a bunch of layers. This could act even nearly like what we call like a quasi-isotropic material because all these layers together act kind of like something that's isotropic. But if you look at more detail, like if we only have a singular layer of this, we have a very directional product because we see we're really stiff up top. If we load the strain, that's going to actually induce bending because the upper level, the upper layer is not going to extend very much, but the other layers are going to significantly. And so uh, this is one of the reasons we need that methods of this class. The short fiber thing, we already talked about that, those can be in the particles that you see here, could be actually distributed so they act like a pseudo isotropic material, which means we can use our old methods. And laminated, uh, laminated composites, we already talked about that. This is just another quick look as we're getting started at some of the different fiber reinforced products we might have. Uh, one of the common ones will be a continuous unidirectional product like we see upper right. And the next most common is probably a woven one where we have fi uh, continuous fibers in one direction, continuous fibers in another direction, and woven together just like your t-shirt. Now your t-shirt has very little compression strength, but if we embed it in a resin and cured that puppy, it would have better, it would start having compression and bending property, just like when you start your shirt too much or when it gets too dirty and it kind of stands rigid on its own. That's kind of what we're seeing, you know, pack it full of mud and see how the strength improves. Don't tell mother. Other products would be random fibers and oriented fibers. These oriented fibers look like they're going to give you a directional product. Once again, we're going to get a different property longitudinally versus widthwise and transverse. The random could be very unpredictable properties, or if it's mixed well enough, it could get, give us something pseudo-ish isotropic that we could pretend is isotropic. So those are some of the things that we're going to be dealing with as we move forward. What do you need to know? Well, you're going to need to be good at matrix, matrix algebra. Because of all the properties, where before we just had an isotropic property, all we needed was E and G and Poisson's ratio to characterize the material. And these three are linked, so you really only have two unique uh, variables to fully characterize the material property. Not so with composite. We're going to find out the different directions have different properties. And we're actually even going to have to simplify things to do anything with some of those calculations. And we're going to do this with matrix methods. Remember, matrix methods allow us, where before we just like an E and an epsilon, E times the strain gives us the stress, right? Modulus times strain is stress. That's three constants, three variable constants with a single value of each. Now we're going to have a bunch of values that affect the different directions, where before we saw if we pull on something, we're going to get a strain that's directly proportional to the stress. And we're also going to get a strain in the other directions that's also proportional to stress. The one is proportional through the, po uh, through the modulus and the other one through the Poisson's ratio. Now if we pull on this with some materials, not only are we going to have that extensional and that transfer strain, we're also going to get shearing strains and other things. And because we've got more variables, we're going to need like a matrix of stiffnesses instead of just a single E value. And we're going to have a matrix of strain values, which is going to provide a matrix of stress values. This means we're going to be operating 
on matrices. Now these are not that hard matrices. They're not like our fine element matrices, which can be huge. We're typically going to boil this down to a three by three kind of matrix or a six by six kind of matrix, which is going to give us three strain values and three stress values or six and six. So it's not that difficult. However, if we start trying now multiplying out these matrices can be done fairly rapidly by somebody know that knows what they're doing by hand. But that is much slower than if you learn to use your calculator to perform matrix operations. Learning to input a matrix and operate on a matrix and solve these systems of equations rapidly. All this can be done by the modern handheld calculator. And you're going to need one. I recommend the TI Inspire CAS version. I've got the TI Inspire CX2 CAS version. For years I've used this one, and I used its predecessor before this, the, TI, uh, the HP 48GX. I'm not finding these except the old ones anymore. And actually, this is while this has done a great job for me, I have uh, I found that it's difficult to see your matrix at once. It's actually not really easy on this either to see your whole matrix at one, but it actually is a lot easier than this puppy. So looking at some of the calculators my students were using, I went and bought one last year so that I could start providing tools to help students do this part accurately because I found out students are not doing that very well. And if you try to do all this by hand, you're going to be embedded in a bog of mathematics that you were probably hoping to forget. Uh, learn to use, get a good calculator, learn to use it. If you get this one, I will do my best to provide as many tools to use that as possible. Any other ones like the, T, uh, the uh, HP has a good one also. You're going to be on your own because I can only do so much at one time. Uh, in the future, I may try and develop some tools for that one too. But if you get this one, you'll be able to utilize the pieces uh, that I'll be laying out for you guys. So we're going to need that if you learn to input and output matrices and operate on them so you can take the inverse and solve systems equations with just a couple punches of a button like you're doing simple plus, minus, divide, multiply, you're going to find that will enable you, that will free up your mind to focus on the other techniques of composite analysis that we need to learn. If you're embedded in solving all these matrix equations by yourself, while that's admirable, that will pull your attention away from mastering these principles and make it much harder for you to score well in my class. We're going to be moving fast. We're going to be learning a lot. And you need something, a calculator, that will help you to do that. It's like a tool, getting the right tool for the job in your garage. Cowboys know all about this, right? With the right weapon. Okay, so matrix methods. You're going to notice I have a, a matrix algebra little video out there, a little short one that will help you in this. I also started posting some MATLAB videos to help you. Now, the MATLAB, you're not going to be able to use on my test. You could use it for your homework. What you really need to do is make sure I, I encourage you. We're going to be learning MATLAB in this class, too, uh, and using it. But what you need to prioritize is foremost having a calculator and knowing how to use it for matrix methods, because that is the only thing that you will be able to use in a test, that in your text. You're going to have your book and you're going to have your calculator, and that is what you're going to use to solve this. This enables you to focus on the methods we're going to use. This is going to give you a resource to grab the method equation that you need and to use it in an appropriate way, standing on top of your knowledge from carefully following through and working the homeworks. But this will keep you focused on the methods we're learning here so that you're not bogged down in your old algebra class, you already had a lot of units in various math, calculus, and linear algebra classes, and that was enough. Now we need to start applying these principles, and your calculator will en enable you to focus while we're doing that. So watch my supplementary video on matrix algebra, and on and in there I have a little bit of help on the how to do some simple things with TI Inspire, just a kind of an inkling. Eventually I'll try and put together a playlist for TI-inspired tools to help you. There's also some good online little book resources you can grab. Okay, we're also going to need the properties in composite materials. For these, we can go back to our appendix. Appendix C has all these for, and we'll look at that uh, next class. 
We're going to need our engineering calculator. We talked about that. This is the capability you're going to need. And we're also going to be using MATLAB in this class. MATLAB is not required for this class. For those of you not taking my class that are just industry professionals, you can ignore that if you wish because I'm going to give you all the methods you need to use. However, especially for industry folks, if you learn to uh, work with some of these problems in, in uh, with MATLAB, not only solving them on your calculator, but solving them with MATLAB, you will have a tool that you can use out into the future for your career. Now, many companies like the Boeings and stuff often have their own little codes in-house where they expect you to go and use that code for solving composites. Fine, use it. But you can still do it by hand. You can still do it using your own calculator or your own MATLAB program and make sure you agree with the results. That will make you a much stronger analyst than just punching buttons on a black box program that you don't understand. Got it? Okay, so let's look at some, that's basically our lecture, our first lecture. Uh, let's look at some conceptual things just to kind of reset our mind. This class is going to make which of the following possible? Analysis of solid materials, materials with particles, materials with continuous fibers, or mat analysis of laminates of materials. Think about that. Which of these is now becoming possible? That's what it makes possible. Now, while the methods we're going to cover will do all of these, the first two could have been handled with our basic mechanics and materials class. The material of this class can be said to be what? Too hard for the average student? Applicable to aircraft? Applicable to rockets? Applicable to some targets that mechanical and civil engineers make? What do you think? That's right. Practical, not for the faint of heart. Well, actually, pretty much all of them, except for too hard for the average student. Uh, if you have gotten this far in your engineering curriculum, or if you have made it through an engineering curriculum, you're out there in industry, you, this is not too hard. Whether you scored great at the top of your class, or whether you repeated classes over and over and didn't learn much, if you got this far, you can do it. You need to apply yourself, because it's not as easy. Okay. That's all I got for you. That's our first lecture. Stay tuned. We're going to be getting waiting. This is like we just walked out on the grass at the lake. And we're looking at the lake and we feel like, yeah, I'm a water skier now. But next lecture, we're going to start wading into ankle deep water. Like when you put your water ski on and you get your ski rope and you got one foot out of the water and one foot in. And then we're going to take off with that boat. We're going to toss that rope. We're going to step onto the water. And we're going to be out there skiing like there's no tomorrow in deep analysis. Stay tuned.